Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to day one of Nickel Squash's virtual online training, Quarantine Edition. My name is Jamal Callender, and for those that don't know me, I coach for Nickel Squash here in New York City. I've been told by a few select individuals that I have a face for radio and a voice for newspaper. These people are unequivocally 100% correct, unfortunately. I also have zero editing skills, so this will all have to be done in one take. My deepest heartfelt apologies to everyone out there. Anyways, I'm here today to kick off part one of our afternoon training component with video analysis. Every day, we will go over rallies from professional matches with a couple collegiate and even junior matches sprinkled in for good measure, looking to analyze technical and tactical points loosely based in our theme of the week. I thought it was appropriate to kick off our analysis piece with a match of a player that is instantly recognizable by our players, parents, and coaches. The first player that comes to mind when you see our beautiful logo. A player that is synonymous with our ethos of grit, hard work, and tenacity. The man, the myth, the legend, Davide Bianchetti. Just playing, of course. Psst. Hey, Peter. Don't fire me. Had to get that disclaimer so I wouldn't be looking for a new job in a couple of days. Peter Nickel, for those that don't know, is one of the all-time greats of the game of squash. He's held the number one spot in the world for a combined five years. Won the World Open once, British Open twice, Tournament of Champions thrice, etc., etc., etc. Most famously, though, Peter was innocently referred to as a former top 20 player by one of our students years ago. Ironically enough, that player is technically not wrong. Opposite Peter is Davide Bianchetti, former Italian number one and owner of 12 PSA Tour titles. Davide reached a high of number 24 in the PSA Tour in 2004 and represented Italy in countless international events. Davide was renowned for being extremely wily, fit, and determined, if not a bit of a maniac on court. The theme that we'll be addressing this week is using height and variation on court, so what better player to analyze but the lob drop maestro himself, Peter Nickel. In this match, Peter and Davide are playing in a legend squash event during the Grasshopper Cup in Zurich, Switzerland in 2018. Turning to the video, we see Peter is comfortably leading 5-1. Can Peter continue his dominance? or will Davide start to mount a comeback? Let's find out. Even by the body language on the perfectly paused video, I'm um, just saying, we can see Davide bent over double, doing his best hunchback impersonation, while Peter is ready and poised, if not looking a little model-esque. We'll watch the rallies in their entirety, then double back in slow motion to go over some talking points. So let's begin with this rally with Peter serving at 5-1. So even though Peter didn't win this rally, we can still see that he technically accomplished a few things well. Let's go back in the rally and look at those things. that Peter hits a somewhat more lifted serve to get him to the tee and to get Davide to the back corner. Davide plays a decent backhand drop to which Peter gets under the ball and lifts to the back right corner, giving himself time to get to the tee and pinning Davide in a more compromised position in the back right corner.
here we see Davide also use a nice cross court lob using height on the front wall to really pin Peter into the back left corner, forcing him to stretch and play a more defensive volley. On that shot, Peter was a bit outstretched by the good width that Davide accomplished on his cross court. So instead of flicking, Peter decides to use height on the front wall to play a straight, lifted drive to force Davide to the back right corner, not letting him get in front of him once again at the tee. I feel the need to pause, and Peter, you're not going to like this, but while we're doing this in slow motion, if you get the chance, take a look at Peter's face on every shot, or right before every single shot. There's a very famous, or infamous, Peter Nickel grimace that we hope you guys don't pick up. So on that last shot there, Davide drags Peter into the back, sorry, into the front right corner with a good working boost. Let's go back to this again. My apologies. So yes, Davide has dragged Peter to the front right corner with a good working boast and has clearly followed up his shot by taking a very high tee position. Technically, or theoretically, Peter should lift his way out of trouble like he's been doing throughout the entirety of the rally to get Davide away from this position and back to the back left corner or back right corner. But instead, Peter decides to hit a flatter cross court directly onto Davide's racket, which he's able to volley, if not a bit awkwardly, into the open space. All right, the next rally that we're going to be looking at takes place a couple minutes later with Davide serving at 4-6 down, though he's won the last three points in a row to go on his own little mini streak. With, with Peter now under a bit of pressure, let's see if he can regain control in this rally and regain control of the match. What a rally. That being said, let's hope that Peter took a page out of 
Jess's workbook and decided to hit the gym to do one of her famous workouts the day after so he wouldn't be looking like this for his next match. Anyway, let's go back to the beginning of the rally and analyze some technical and tactical points. Peter playing with his hair as per usual before the rally. Gotta make sure he looks good for the crowd sitting in the front wall, behind the front wall. So if we can pause very quickly, from the very first shot of the rally, we can see that Davide has established control of the middle of the court. Right now, Peter is basically at his whim. With Davide can play a boast, he can play a cross-court drive, he can play a straight drive. Unless the quality of Davide's shot is very poor, Peter is going to be forced to defend on his next shot, which is all set up with good length to begin the rally. Adjustments like this, that or sorry, adjustments like the one that I'm about to make, should be done not just after a match or after a game, but during the rally. So as we pointed out earlier, Peter was under the cosh. Davide had control of the rally from the word go. Yet about five or six shots later, Peter is now in front of Davide looking to hunt the ball. What do you guys think Peter did differently? Comment down below. Okay, so we can see here that Davide has played a great attacking drop from the back left corner. Let's break down the technical points. Peter, because he was so far forward uh, while Davide played his shot, was able to, re to recover and get on the ball earlier than he normally would. Technically speaking, Peter knows that Davide's shot is great, so he shouldn't counterattack off of it. Generally speaking, if you can't counterattack, you should be playing a defensive lob to get yourself back to this area, the T. So Peter starts low, stays low, and with an open racket face, makes sure he gets under the ball so that he can lift and create height on the front wall, pinning, uh, forcing Davide away from this area and getting him to the back right corner. You can all see where that ball landed on the front wall. The ball landed about there. One of the criminal mistakes that we see our juniors make constantly is not using enough height on the front wall. When in doubt, overuse the height, not underuse it. If Peter's lob had hit around here, Davide could easily volley either across the T-line or he could step forward and take that next ball early, meaning Peter would not have time to recover back to the T. Instead, because Peter hit the ball further up here on the front wall, now Davide is forced to retreat somewhat to play his shot and we can see by the time uh, Davide plays his next ball, Peter is in a much better position to recover the next ball, uh, the next shot. So technically, Peter attempts to do the same exact thing that we pinpointed earlier, getting an open racket face and getting down to the ball. 
Unfortunately, the quality of Davide's previous shot was simply too high, so Peter's attempt at a lift doesn't quite get high enough, which Davide then looks to volley. Amazing grunt by Peter. That wasn't someone in the crowd, that was Peter. So you might be wondering why Davide is exclusively playing to the right side of the court, when in theory, the left side of the court is slightly more open. Reason being, A, Davide's forehand is most likely his more dominant side, but also, Peter's backhand is definitely his less attacking option, or his less attacking side. So Davide is trying to hold and then put the ball into the back right corner, knowing that if he can do that consistently, and do it well, that he's completely limiting Peter's options to attack. That groan that we just heard from Peter is the lactic acid building up in his quads after constantly going from here to there to there to there. So after about four or five shots in a row where Peter was under pressure, he's finally able to lift the ball on the front wall, getting the ball up around this area on the front wall to force Davide to the back of the court, giving him time to take a little breather, but also, very simply, to get in front of his opponent. Like the previous rally, we can see Davide playing a very good attacking drop shot from what should be a more compromised position. Peter is somewhat caught off guard, but because he's so forward, he can cover the ball with relative ease. We can see uh, Happy Feet making its reappearance, but Dave expected Peter to have to either chip the ball straight again or play straight drop due to the quality of his straight drop. Peter, because he was somewhat decent at squash, was able to use his renowned racket skills and flick the ball cross court off the side wall getting Davide, or taking advantage of Davide, Davide being out of position. Once again, the height on the front wall was used immaculately. Peter's cross-court lob hit around there on the front wall, ensuring that Davide cannot volley. Because Peter put perfect weight on the shot, not only is he re-establishing his control of the tee, but he's actually able to turn defense into offense because Davide is forced to play a back wall boast as we'll be able to see in a moment, which is arguably, if not definitely, the most defensive shot in squash. After being basically under pressure the entirety of that rally, Peter finally has one opportunity to attack. Because Peter has been lifting all game, Davide is kind of rocking back on his heels and has to cover a myriad of options. So in this rally, or for the next shot, Davide guesses cross-court flick when in reality Peter plays a straight drop. The main reason why that's so effective, or the shot was so effective, is because, uh, is because of Peter's racket preparation and body positioning. We can see here that Peter's on the ball early with his racket in a ready position here. From this position, Peter can play pretty much any shot. Cross-court drop, which Davide guesses. Straight drop, which he eventually hits. Trickle boast, straight drive, straight punch, cross-court lift again, cross-court flick. Davide's kind of caught in no man's land. Unfortunately, Davide picks the wrong option. Peter plays an immaculate straight drop. Good night, Vienna.
And just to pause once again, this is what we hopefully, after five days of workouts, we will not be seeing from you guys. All right, the last rally that we're going to look at, surprisingly, won't be in the same vein as the previous two. With Peter serving, sorry, with Davide serving at 6-9 down, Peter is only two points away from winning the game. In this rally, we'll continue the roast of Peter and look at what you shouldn't do during a rally. Another amazing yelp by Peter. So let's go back and watch in slow motion how that unfolded. Backing off of what we talked about uh, for Peter's last shot, we can see that even on the return of serve, Peter's racket is in the ready position. As Davide serves, Peter turns with the ball and makes sure that he gets his racket ready with his wrist cocked, racket head pointing up, which allows him to actually start his swing properly. Okay, now Davide, as he's shown in the previous two rallies, plays a great working attacking two all boast. Peter, bec probably because he sees the finish line way too early, being 9 6 up, decides to play a punched backhand drive instead of the straight or cross court lob he's been employing to get out of trouble. As we saw in the previous two rallies, when Peter uses height on the front wall, he's able to get his opponent off the tee, which Davide is clearly at right now and force them into the back two corners, which at the very least gets him back into the neutral position in the rally. Instead, Peter decides, as we once again pointed out, to play a punched backhand drive down the right wall. Davide, having followed up his attacking shot, pounce, pounces on Peter's drive and volleys cross court, putting Peter under immense pressure. As that drone sounds very clear, by foregoing height, Peter goes the high risk route of attempting deception to win the rally. Doesn't quite work. So going back to the punched volley, sorry, sorry, to the punched backhand drive down the wall, instead of Peter getting under the ball, he has a much flatter follow through, which means the ball's gonna hit roughly there on the front wall as opposed to there, which paid dividends. Uh, rally ago. I might have rewinded that simply to hear that groan one more time. Anyway, we're going to, that's going to be the end of our analysis for those rallies. We're going to continue to watch the rest of the match to see if Peter can regain his composure, buckle down, and refocus to pull out the victory. Let's see. Another amazing cross-court lob from Peter. 
and then decides to play it directly back to his opponent. Obviously, there is a plan behind hitting the ball directly back to his opponent. He wants to lull him into a false sense of security, thinking that he had him exactly where he wanted him. Or maybe Peter just wanted to show off his silk, silky hands by putting in that cross court drop at the, at the end of the rally. Who knows? YouTube ads are so much fun. Skip this really quickly. Give you guys some insight on what I watch in my free time. And that was the game. So, going back throughout all three rallies, we can see that both players, once again, very wily, very fit, very smart, very technically sound. But what separated the two was Peter's use of height, not only when he was in a very compromised position, but also to, uh, sorry, and to create attack opportunities, but also as an attacking shot. So that was game number one of the Legends Tournament between former world number one, Peter Nickel, and former Italian number one, Davide Bianchetti. It has to be said that, despite the difference in their highest ranking, Peter's always regarded Davide as one of his toughest opponents to play. Do you have any players that you don't necessarily look forward to playing? Feel free to email me at jamal at nickelsquash.com if you'd like to go over strategies to take on your biggest foes. Also, comment down below. What player would you like us to analyze in the future? Have a great rest of the day, and we all look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Ciao!